Good evening, it's your friend Rabbi Kolakowski, the Kobolense Rebbe, and I'm here presenting a few words about the um, whole issue that came up about, I believe her name is Gina Carallo, I could be wrong, and she's on this show The Mandalorian, which I've only seen maybe two episodes of, um, I kind of have a hard time following it because to have a Star Wars show without the Star Wars music just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like Star Wars to me. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I know a lot of people like it. But anyway, she made a statement about comparing uh, the persecution of people in America with the persecutions in Nazi Germany. And I'll tell you the truth, I think she's right. <coughs> and I'm a Jewish rabbi. I'm not offended by what she said. And it, it you know, and no matter what size it is, side it is. Now, some people are saying, well, you know, it's different being Jewish because you're born Jewish. You're not born as a, a Republican or a Democrat or this and that. But the truth of the matter is Judaism is a belief system. And also, furthermore, you don't really choose what you believe. I've heard people saying this recently, both on the right and on the left, and there's a certain truth to that. It's, you know, if, if you know, certainly we have choices about how we behave, but we don't really have choices about what we believe. We can mold our beliefs. We Our, our beliefs are not immutable. But that doesn't mean that they're not a ch that they are a choice just because they're immutable. Meaning, but just because they're mutable, just because they can be changed. And yes, they change over time. But it doesn't mean that it's a choice. You know, again, with all these other things that people <coughs> say, it's not a choice. It's not a choice. You know. You, you come to certain conclusions and beliefs it's kind of hard to say that that's a choice <coughs> it is something you can become it is something you can change but it's not a choice it's more or less something that happens because I didn't go out and set out and say well I'm going to become a republican or a conservative or a libertarian or whatever else um, or, or, you know, the term classical liberal. And I have changed. I think I was more radical right-wing in my youth and have become more classically liberal with some libertarian leanings. Um, but I sincerely believe that that's what America is all about. And I think, I mean, I was listening to uh, BBC commentary and they were saying, you know, Donald Trump is setting us up as us versus them and this and that. It's not really. It's the Donald Trump is hanging on to his oath that he took to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the Democrats have set themselves up as domestic enemies of the Constitution. And they've abused the Constitution. They changed the rules in the middle of the game. They play in Calvin Ball. And whether or not that was enough to actually change the number of votes really doesn't matter because, again, we follow the rules. We admit that the, like Rand Paul says, you know, there's such a thing as states' rights and there's such a thing as the Electoral College. So it's not, you know, necessarily the realm of the, of the Senate or the House to educate that or, you know, but if there, but the problem I have with what Rand Paul said is that, well, if there's, the states have rights, but they don't have rights to violate the Constitution. Just like the Constitution bans slavery, except for as punishment for a crime, and no state has a right to practice legal slavery uh, in this country because of the Constitutional Amendment banning it banning this practice um, so so to here I don't know if states have the right to do what they did which was change the way that they 
go to the Electoral College in a manner that was not with the consent of the state legislatures. It was, I mean, it, the Constitution is very clear that it's the state legislatures that um, are, are involved with this. The question of the of the uh, uh, how the electors are selected, and if the manner was changed by a judiciary or by someone from the executive branch or some other uh, bureaucrat, which I guess would be in the executive branch, then they are in violation of the Constitution. I don't know if they have, if the states have the right to do that. Now, the legislatures certainly have the right to say they're going to do whatever they want to do to come to the conclusions of appointing the electors. Um, and since they did so, um, meaning I believe all of the state legislatures, uh, you know, approved their electors, sent them in and so forth, so then it's really out of our hands. So yes, Joseph Biden is the duly elected president of the United States under the Constitution, even though the manner by which those votes were uh, taken from the public, the manner by which the popular vote was collected in order to get to the question of electoral college, um, it may have been done in a way that may have been unconstitutional, in which case we should say that any state that did that um, would essentially, uh, those votes should be null and void, but uh, it's, uh, you know, in certain states, their own constitutions require constitutional amendments to change the manner by which the popular vote is, is gotten and so forth. But at this point, it really doesn't matter because the Electoral College is what it is. But the, what this Gina Corallo, I believe her name is, said about the us versus them issue, meaning how she brought up a very valid point. How is it that the Nazis were able to get away with what they did? And it's because they had the backing of the common people. And this othering, really on both sides, is setting us up for disaster. And it has to stop on both sides. It has to stop on our side, it has to stop on their side. But which side is much more virulent about it is the left side. You know, and I think, you know, the, the key to doing this is showing liberals that the left do not represent their values. I think that's really the key to all this, meaning we can disagree about, I, I'm not going to use the word gay rights because I think all human beings have rights and all American citizens have rights and so um, I don't think we should have any disagreements on actual rights of people who are part of the LGBTQ community or not, etc. Um, but I, you know, but the definition of which things are rights and which things are not rights, I think that's really what the question is. You know, and a lot of these issues, I mean, Glenn Beck brought it up today, the progressive left created these issues. The big government, which is again the, the Nazi ideology. Meaning, for example, uh, and this pains me to say, you know, my own, uh, what do they call it, my own selfishness would tell me, oh, Joe, shut your mouth. Because I make, I have my side hustle. Um, signing marriage licenses because as a, a member of the clergy I'm able to sign a marriage license. Uh, different laws in different states about, you know, 
what there is, but I think there was one state, I believe it was Mississippi, one of the southern states that stopped issuing marriage licenses and just said that the people getting married can uh, register their marriages with the state, but no longer will the state be given a license to marriage. The fact of the matter is, this whole story of the marriage license is a horrible, horrific history. The way that the marriage license came to be, there didn't used to be marriage licenses. You know, you could go to your priest, your pastor, your rabbi and get married. And I guess you could go to the Justice of the Peace and get married. But there was no idea that you need to, you know, they've mostly done away with these things, but they used to be blood tests and all these things to ensure that the wrong people are not getting married. And so what Glenn Beck argued, he said that we on the right, instead of making a religious argument, which has no place really in the American body politic, other than that we are registering our religious beliefs and voicing them, that certainly has a place, but to impose that on people who have different religious beliefs, that's not the job of our government. Meaning, you know, if somebody belongs to a liberal church, a liberal temple, uh, or a Native American tribe, or or a, uh, you know, a, a Wiccan coven, and their beliefs are different than those of a traditional Abrahamic religion, including their beliefs about sexuality and marriage. And in America, their religious beliefs are protected. So, of course, you know, there, there should be, nobody could say that uh, you know, a Wiccan high priest cannot officiate at a religious ceremony that's meaningful to two men or two women and to affect their marriage for whatever it is, a year and a day with the hand fasting and the, the customs of the, of the Wiccan religion. Um, that's, that's their prerogative and that's their freedom in this country. So what Glenn Beck said, and, uh, and again, it pains me, and for us clergy, it's a certain bit of a badge of honor to say, you know, I'm a, a real clergyman, I'm an official clergyman because I can sign a marriage license, and if I'm <coughs> registered as a clergyman in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia or in the city of New York, you know, that, that shows I'm the real deal, you know. But the fact of the matter is, again, it's not the government's job to say who's the real deal or not. You know, it's the job of the couple to say, well, this is who I recognize as a member of the clergy, maybe by virtue of my um, of my association, my freedom of association and freedom of religion, I accept upon myself that I'm only going to recognize, you know, someone who was ordained at this seminary as a member of my denominational clergy, and that is my choice as a member of that denomination but the government should have nothing to do with it this is in Germany I was shocked a few years ago I saw there was an opening for the chief rabbi of Munich Germany it was listed on the internet let me uh, let me send my resume why not worse comes to worse maybe I get a free trip to Germany you know I got I, I've traveled for work like that to uh, various foreign countries. And I'd like to visit Germany, visit Worms, where my holy ancestor, the Chavis Yoyer, is buried. Really like to go there. That would be very meaningful to me. At the time, I didn't know I was an from the Chavis Yoyer. Anyway, the thing that shocked me when talking to the president of the synagogue there was how religion works in Germany. Um, is that every everybody pays a religion tax, and so that percentage that comes from the Jewish community pays for the synagogue, and the rabbi 
and the mikveh and the cemeteries and whatever else and that which comes from the Lutheran community goes to the Lutheran church and that which comes from the Muslim community goes to the mosque and the imam and so forth uh, also there's no homeschooling in Germany so you have to uh, you know there are Jewish schools and you have to and, and if you don't agree with the ideology of the Jewish school which I probably wouldn't um, well tough either you go there or you go to the public school and th those are your choices it's not like how in America well I have a choice if I want to send to Satmar or Vizhnitz or Bells or Litvish Yeshiva or modern orthodox religious Zionist Yeshiva and so forth or to the public school or the Catholic school or the or the Protestant school, or the or the uh, Muslim uh, uh, madrasa, or whatever I want to send to, because it's America and I can do what I want, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else. And I really believe that this Gina Corallo brings up a very good point, and that is we have to have dialogue. With, specifically with those we disagree with. In 800 with. feet, turn left onto Main Street. We can't let this keep happening where we're just fighting all the time. We have to recognize, yes, there are different views and it's okay. Let's turn find left a, onto Main Street. Exit navigation there. But we have to find our common ground. We cannot be insisting on my way or the highway. That's not the American way. And so we have to recognize, yeah, some people have a different belief than I have. And that's okay. So, um, and the truth of the matter is you can even believe in communism. You can believe in whatever you want. Just don't push it on me. I mean, you want to you want to do an experiment and open your own commune, you know, and you got enough people who agree with you. Go ahead, do it. You know, I mean, you know, the, and America has a history of that, and uh, you know, and for the most part, the people see it doesn't work. Whether it goes back to the pilgrims. Or whether it's the Oneida uh, mansion and their cult there uh, with, with the free love and everything. And their kids, you know, were like, we don't, we don't want to do this. And not only were they, although they were persecuted, but the truth of the matter was, was the next generation were like, yeah, we just want to be like everybody else. This, this doesn't work for us. And so in the free market of religious freedom, what I call spiritual capitalism, where you have a free market and you can you can uh, you can compete, and so obviously there's going to be a number of people who are interested in trying this out. Let's see if it works, and it doesn't work, so let's move on. And there might be another group trying different ideas, and that's fine. But you keep it among yourselves, just like. You know, our community has our beliefs and our standards of education and so forth. And if it doesn't work, right, some people leave, some people don't like it. And I don't have a problem with that on a legal level or anything. But I do sure as hell have a problem when there are people who are trying to take away our rights to try our experiment here of, uh, you know, our religious freedoms. And, you know, where, whereas, you know, these are private schools and we're doing our own thing and it's really none of your business, it, you know, as long as we're not hurting anybody. And this definition of what is hurt and what is harm that's expanded, obviously if someone commits an actual crime, you know, that, ha that's, that has consequences. And if someone's actually hurting someone, they have to be persecuted prosecuted uh, that has to stop but is it really hurting someone to raise them in a different to raise a child according to your culture and your values 
that's different than those of the the rest of the world around you and then when the child is 18 he's gonna make his own decision is this for him is it not am I gonna try something different you know I mean a lot of people they see what happened in America with how many people you know you can say you know that their grandparents were Orthodox Jews and and the next generation that might not even be Jewish anymore and a lot of that was because the, the grandparent the, it was a different world and even the you know like like my Rav in, here in White Lake he says you know his parents founded the day school in Chicago which is now the Ari Crown Hebrew Academy at the time it was called something else Chicago Hebrew Academy whatever it was and he had what 20 kids or whatever in the yeshiva and it was a big difficulty to try to get kids to get out of public school and go to the yeshiva because nobody wanted it then you know in the in the 1920s and 30s in, in Chicago um, you know he, he said you had the Rabbonim you had Hasidish Rebbe's you had everybody and they sent their kids to public school you know Rabbi Tversky was was Nifter now and when he was a kid uh, he they they had him in the um, in the uh, in the Christmas play and his mother called and they thought the Robinson is going to complain why is my son in the Christmas play in the public school and and he's Jewish, he shouldn't be in the play. No, she said, oh, my Ebola, he's he's very short. Make sure he's right up front. And I said, well, you're not nervous about having him perform in a Christmas pageant? He said, no, if, if I didn't raise him to be strong enough to stay a Jew despite being in a Christmas play, then I didn't do my job. It's not your job to do, you know, my, and that's true. And they're right, and she was right. You know, we can, we can, you know, do it this way. There's different ways that we do it, but he he stuck to his way, and and that's not everybody. You know, it took a lot of a lot of davening from the from Rav Shlomo Babaver and from the and from the Kedusha Tzian that that those kids should stay from, you know. From their Zetas and to the Hornish Stipler and so forth. Took a lot of Siata Deshmaya and they did it. But not everybody can do it. And a lot of people did it. And I don't know how forward thinking, you know, the average uh, Rav or Rebola in Chicago was compared to Milwaukee. You know, I think the Hornish Stipler Reb in Milwaukee was. It's a little different, you know. He, he knew what he was doing, and the um, so a lot of these rebelach that we don't, their children aren't following in their footsteps, and they don't have a mamalavaka. It was part of it. Might have been just they didn't care, you know. They they got here to America, and they're able to do their thing. Or also, part of it might have just been they're pragmatic and real, and they felt like there's no way for me to stand up to this. But the Satmarov saw, no, we can. We can stay Hasidish here in America and remain who we are and not give up our culture. And we're not going to be bossed around like, you know, by the Jewish Federation or someone else telling us this is the way we got to do things because that's none of your business and if there's some kind of government grants or something that the Jewish Federation was funneling to yeshivas this and that Satmar Rebbe said I don't need to go through you I can start my own organization and he did it and and through that type of greatness through that type of forward thinking he was able to build from, from a small group of clean-shaven Holocaust survivors into the, the largest Hasidic community in the world. 
<coughs> but also the truth of the matter is we can have one foot in one world and another for another world. Now, a lot of people had a lot of PTSD. You know, I saw Lipa Schmelzer talking to, to Peter Cerrillanto, uh, Cerrillanto, I think his name is, Sartello. Um, and he said, you know, his father would never do an interview like this because he was afraid. You know, he, he, he came out of the camps and he, he was suspicious of everybody. And, you know, like, you know, I know one one of our local Rebbes, who I respect very much, I asked one of the Hasidim there in his community, does the Rebbe, does the Ruv, does he, uh, does he vote? And he said, no, he's afraid if he, if he registers to vote, now they have his name on file, and then they're going to take us away. Maybe there's some wisdom in that, because maybe it will happen. Maybe, maybe Gina Corallo's right. Maybe they'll do that, but how can they get away with it? I mean, that's the point that she she wasn't. The point that she was bringing up is, and it doesn't matter which side. The way you get away with that is when it's all us versus them, and we don't have some stadlonas like we say in our community. You know, meaning in our community we have people who communicate with the world at large. We have people who argue for our interests and so forth and represent us and it's like a community liaison and so forth because of our language barriers and so forth and we appreciate that but even you know there was the tzaddikim there was the who, who understood meaning like the just a simple thing you know, the Blues of Rebbe, how did he survive? When, when they brought him, you know, before whoever's going to decide, are you going to go to the right or the left in the camps? You're going you're gonna to live or you're going to die? And he saw it was his old neighbor who was making these decisions. And every morning when they passed by, he would say hello, and maybe they even talk a few words, and they were friendly. And then uh, here he is standing in front of this man, who's ready to decide whether he lives or dies. And, and he said, Hey, Rabiner, what are you doing here? You go to the right, you're going to live. Or, or on this side of the of the pond, Baba Vareba, Skhusi Galeno, the second Rip Shleba Baba, right? At his funeral, there was an African-American painter crying. Jimmy, and everybody knew Jimmy. Jimmy, why are you crying? He said, what do you mean, why am I crying? The, the, uh, the rabbi, I, I, he gave me my whole life. You know, everybody hires me to paint because the rabbi told, told them to hire me. How could, how could I not cry for this man who was there for me when I was in need? I wasn't Jewish. But he cared, and he, and he was able to make a connection. And the Rebbe said, you know, he saw that the Rebbe and, and maybe his daughters were being a little bit insistent on certain things, the painting, and the, uh, the Rebbe said, Jimmy, come over here. He said, you're not perfect, and I'm not perfect. Only God is perfect, but you're doing a very good job, and I'm going to tell all my friends to hire Jimmy to do their painting. <laughs> 